Welcome to Hope on Fire, relevant talk radio for young adults. Whether you're 25 or 45, there's bound to be a discussion that you care about. Our mission is to share practical ways to find God in your everyday life. Our host today is Sabine Vettel. It only takes a quick glance at the magazine stands and surfing through TV channels to figure out that to be desirable is to be beautiful. Actually, the ideal woman, according to our culture, is drop-dead gorgeous. As women, we are tempted to buy into what others define as beautiful. What about you? Are you tired of looking at yourself in the mirror and wish that you were in somebody else's body? Do you feel trapped by the obsessive search for the perfect body? then this show is for you. Welcome uh, to Hope on Fire. If you're listening today, you may have asked the question or been asked, does this make me look fat? Um, Well, that's the title of our program today, Does This Make Me Look Fat? And my name is Sabine Vattel, your host for today on Hope on Fire. And uh, to help us with this program topic, um, addressing women and body image, um, I have with me some very smart people to help me uh, with this discussion. And listeners, I want to introduce you to our panel uh, today. And the uh, first person I want you to meet is Sherry Carrick. And Sherry's from Kansas. Um, she has a Master's of Business Administration. And Sherry, you're multi-talented. I could go on and on about your um, your uh, resume. But you're a manager at business development at Florida Hospital Healthcare System, an accomplished musician, and um You want people to know you love your cat, Paris, and you love traveling. I guess those two are connected. And um, Sherry also has the distinction of um, being crowned, having been crowned, Miss Lincoln, Nebraska. So, Sherry, welcome to our program today. Thank you. And just having you here is going to be really interesting to hear your insights on our topic. I also want you to um, meet Nicole Rucker. She's a social worker by trade, and uh, she's a seminar speaker and presenter on women's issues and families. Um, she's also served as a counselor for pregnant teens and has led adolescent empowerment groups. And she's married to one man, the love of her life. And uh, Nicole, welcome to our program today. Thank Glad you. Glad you could be here. And uh, last but not least, we have Jennifer Liz Garcia, a uh, vivacious 20-year-old <laughs> <laughs> radiology student at the Florida Hospital College of Health Sciences. And um, she's just passionate about life about family, about friends, and passionate about a lot of things. Right, Jennifer? Yeah, thanks. (laughs) Thank you for being here and uh, gracing us with your presence as well. Yeah, and um, anyway, part of the reason why I'm really passionate about this topic, um, ladies, is I was browsing on a woman's magazine while I was at the doctor's office, and I came across this um, statistics that an average of close to 30% of women do not go to school or advance themselves in their career because they were embarrassed by the way they looked. And my heart broke when I read this, and I thought, what a tragedy um, to be held back because of the way you you think you look. And I think it's such wasted potential, wasted gift, and it's just not acceptable. And we can all relate. Maybe that's why my heart broke, because we can all relate to some extent with feeling inadequate about our appearances at one point or another. Anyway, I want to hear what you think. So um, maybe as a way to begin our discussion, we can talk about... Um, kind of what was your standard of beauty growing up, you know? Maybe I could start with you, Jennifer. Well, um, since I'm Puerto Rican and my family, well, we're all Hispanic and or multicultural, when growing up, body image wasn't really a big thing. Um, it wasn't a big deal? It wasn't a big look. deal, the way that we looked. But it was our, our major thing with, because of, I guess, our ethnicity is that we have curves and we're, you know, like... My mama says that real women have curves. Right. So if we were, like, stick thin, if you are smaller, they tend to look at you like, oh, have you eaten today? Are you okay? Or are you feeling well? And, yeah. I mean, for us, or for myself growing up with my mom and my dad and all my cousins and everything, we were perfectly fine being a size 10 or 12. The cousins that I did have that were on the smaller side, my grandma always used to look at them like, I'm going to go make you food right now. Um, <laughs> Eat your whole plate and everything like that. Because growing up, it was like, eat your plate when you're served. And, you know, if you're chunky or whatever you want to say, pleasantly plump, it's because you're happy and you're healthy. It's a good sign. And I think, you know, I come from a background that actually very similar. I mean, in the Caribbean, you expect it to have... I like that. Some curves. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's seen as normal. I mean, what about you, Nicole, in terms of your background? Well, I'm I'm a Southerner. And so for me, growing up, the picture of beauty was more of a Southern belle. Mm-hmm. Yes, Southern bells are pictured to be 
slim, graceful people, but more so it was the behaviors that uh, uh, go along Mm -hmm. with being uh, that lady, meaning we're well-spoken, graceful, and poised, that you're soft-spoken, and genteel comes to mind. For right. Like, so, so well, it's not so much the you saying it's not so much your size, but much more your behavior Demeanor. that was sort of emphasized. But with that mm-hmm. came that image of being kind of petite. It did. It did. I don't have. I've, I've always been very thin, so my family has never really pushed size for mm-hmm. me. Uh, the, what I always struggled with was being more. Um, being quieter, Nicole, right. you're you're too loud. You're too much of a tomboy. That's mm-hmm. not very ladylike. So those were the things for me. But even though the size is something that people have in their mind, it's more so if you can be graceful, if you can be a good mother, wife, if you can be gentle. Those are the things that were more valued so from I my have, perspective. Oh, thank you, uh, Nicole. So I, so I can, I hear that you. It wasn't so much an issue for you growing up, but I can hear a collective groan out there of people who, um, <laughs> who cannot identify with being thin. Maybe it's my own groan, <laughs> 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 but who cannot identify with that necessarily. But I, but not everybody's as as fortunate. Now, how do you think culture defines uh, what is beautiful? Maybe you have something to say about that. Um, a sherry. Well, if you look at the media influence, I mean, the billboards, the print ads, the mm-hmm. fashion magazines, I mean, clearly it's all towards being very, very thin. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, most people out there may or may not know that what you see in the print ads is has been touched up by computers yeah. and it's not actually real. No, we're trying to achieve an ideal that's not even real. Now, is right. that an Amer- Do you guys think it's an American um, phenomenon, this idea of, of uh, thinness? Because we hear a lot in the media about this uh, pressure to be thin. I do, I honestly think it is. Because if, like, I live in Florida right now, but when I go home to Puerto Rico, even though, you know, it's a territory of the United States, when I go there, like, the clothes, I swear, the clothes are made differently, everything's different. You see a beautiful woman, a man will whistle at a woman that's probably a size 12. Mm-hmm. And then he'll look at the size two and go, oh, I don't she move there. Looks, <laughs> you know, she looks sickly. And then, like, you, um, you, you hear stories about, um, you know, different cultures in different countries and how, like, this is a beautiful woman compared to ours. If you look at Miss Universe, mm-hmm. um, I, I think the last Miss Universe, I noticed that St. Thomas, she was a plus-size woman, and she was obviously beautiful because she was in the Miss Universe competition. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned you were Puerto Rican. You mentioned you're from a Latina background, and every culture seems has, like, their beauty burdens, you know? Mm-hmm. more There's an increased uh, number of women, for example, Asian women, who are more and more getting the, the surgery to kind of, uh, change their mm-hmm. eyelids. I don't know how yeah. you, you know, to to make a crease so yeah. they can put eyeshadow on there. Mm-hmm. Oh, is that the purpose? Yeah. Okay. I thought. Well, <laughs> part of it is I didn't want to want to change your, the Asian mm-hmm. look, and um, you know, I was reading a, a an article for white women generally for Caucasian women. Size is a when it comes to body image is very sensitive issue tends to be, but um, for African American or for women of color it tends to be the hair. I mean, we're discussing that the hair is a very sensitive issue because through history hair has kind of identified. Uh, the differences. Um, I don't know if you can identify in terms of as a Latina. Well, with me, well, because I don't know, I guess because of my culture, we're like mixed. There's every, like, there can be a white Hispanic with blonde, straight hair with blue eyes, and you'll go, okay, she's Hispanic, or there can be a black Hispanic with Afro hair, and mm-hmm. you're just like that. Like, from my background, my mother's mixed between a black Hispanic and a white Hispanic. My grandmother has Afro hair, and my mm-hmm. grandfather predominantly Spaniard, then he has, you know, the, like, nice, flowy hair, I guess you could mm. say. But my mom has a mixture of both, and her, I think her hair looks beautiful. Yeah. I honestly don't think there's bad hair, good hair. Um, maybe it's the way that I perceive it's in the way you maintain your hair. And I mean, if you groom yourself properly, it's fine. But yeah, and you think and you think that way. Yeah. But I think so, some of us have, um, it's, if, even in grain, like, can you think of other... Mm-hmm. Um, beauty expectations that are sort of ingrained in what we do and we don't even realize it. Well, if you look at where the source of most of the media comes from, it's the U.S. and Europe with some out of South America also. So Mm -hmm. I think that impacts what 
the standard out there in society is mm -hmm. influenced by is where the uh, majority of the media comes from. Mm -hmm. And I think what we're challenging our, cha our listeners to do is sort of to become aware of where they get their cues. Because even as I'm sitting here, I mean, I have bone straight hair, but naturally, I don't have quite an afro, but I mean, I wear a relaxer so that my hair is, is sort of, uh, you know, Different <laughs> than if you know if I didn't have it, and um, so I, I this program pr prepare for this program got me thinking about you know um, how much influence how much I have been influenced, and I'm you know I'm proud to be a, a woman of color, I'm proud to be who I am, but I have to question a lot kind of the choices I make, and I think we're inviting our listeners to do that to kind of um, think about why they make certain choices, and it's become part of me now. I think I'm not going to go revert into some kind of an afro or you know some kind of strange hairdo <laughs> but <laughs> or or i'm not calling it strange but a more <laughs> natural look but it's strange to me because it's no longer it seems who i am but that's going to probably spark controversy you guys <laughs> hope on fire.org if you're going to write about that that's that's fine you can um share your your thoughts about that but you know i was telling you guys you know growing up you know we watched a certain tv show in which the women you know used to fling their hair <laughs> and my sisters and i what we used to do is put towel, <laughs> towels on our hair or, or a sweater and we used to <laughs> flung our fake you know it was really a sweater but fair hair even as kids we get these messages of mm -hmm. what the standard of beauty is um it's true they're getting younger and younger also i know of more than one girl that's in elementary school i know of, off the top of my head a nine-year-old and a ten-year-old that struggle with their body image mm -hmm. they diet a nine-year-old oh, wow. dieting mm -hmm. so it's like mm -hmm. how is that influencing them at such a young age it's mm -hmm. just incredible and I'm, what if you had mentioned Barbie? And I'm, we're not going to bash Barbie here necessarily. But uh, I think, you know, yeah. Barbie, but perhaps, you know, the Barbie dolls, I think I was reading on average, uh, three, three year olds, three 11 year olds, um, on average have an, a Barbie doll and they get their cues. Um, I, I just don't think a Barbie doll is realistic. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look yeah. at the Barbie dolls, <laughs> well, I mean, it's just not realistic because if you're playing with a Barbie doll growing up, you're, you know, either you have the little kids that are like, I want to be like Barbie when I grow up. You can't be like Barbie when you grow up. I read this one article. If Barbie was a real woman, she'd be anatomically incorrect. She no. Didn't. Hey, I got this girl. I, yeah. got, I got you. I got you. It I says know. here, if Barbie was a real human being, she would need some major reconstructive surgery just to survive. <laughs> so if people are killing themselves look like a Barbie. It ain't going to work. I mean, it's just not yeah. going to work. So but it's not humanly possible. It's <laughs> not. But also, the younger that we are, the more we're absorbing culture, language, et cetera, et cetera, expectations of our society. So if we're giving children dolls to play with, they may not even consciously say to themselves, oh, you know, I want to be that when I grow up. No. But the more you're saturated, that's who you assimilate. You're supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And it's more unconscious, I think, than a conscious decision that people make. Mm -hmm. And Nicole, we're going to talk about when we come to the uh, second half of our program, more practical issues on how to address um, these um, these messages we get unconsciously. So come back, listeners. We'll talk some more about this. Welcome back, listeners, to Hope on Fire as we talk about, does this make me look fat? My women and the, the issues of body image. And um, we have some wonderful, wonderful um, panel uh, members here. We have, of course, Sherry Carrick and Nicole Rucker and Jennifer Garcia. Jennifer Liz Garcia. <laughs> I missed all your, your, your news. You know, we often hear the cliche, ladies, um, that beauty is on the inside. And... Um, but the truth is that people don't see your inside first. Right. And is it so wrong, you know, to strive to be, to look good? And I know I, I don't think it's wrong to strive to look. I don't know. It depends. Like, I think if you have, like, a good reason to look good, I mean, not really a good reason, but if you feel like you're waking up in the morning and you're getting dressed and you're putting on your makeup or whatever it is you do for yourself mm -hmm. and so that you feel good, then fine. But if you find yourself putting makeup on to a point where it's like two hours a day mm -hmm. doing all of this stuff that's really unnecessary and kind of over the limit mm -hmm. for other people then like really who are you trying to satisfy yourself or everyone else in your life mm -hmm. you're losing yourself yeah in, in pleasing other people yeah that's go ahead Don. Nicole. i was just gonna say um you know i was listening to a discussion 
not long ago about false humility and the idea of, you know, we've got to keep ourselves um, natural and being the most humble that we can be. Well, there's a difference, I think, between humility and um, a false humility. Mm. Humility being simple. Right. And, and, we, we and women, you know, Christian, when we talk about Christian women, you had said that, you know, Christian women um, equal, what is it you said, the burlap sack or whatever. <laughs> oh. We think about, you know, you can't be too beautiful if you're Christian, but you bring a really ex- excellent point. Well, it's true. I mean, if if we make ourselves be the exact opposite of beauty to the point of mm. causing ourselves attention for the the state of unkempt that we right. are. Sure. I mean, what is that going to mean? You know, it's like being simple is one thing, mm. but distraction because of going to the opposite extreme, mm-hmm. that's not a, that's not a positive either. Mm. It's funny when you say extreme. It's, it's something struck in my mind. Extreme makeover, you know. And, um, oh gosh. <laughs> and in terms of what that play, what role that does does, um, and maybe this, I don't know, maybe it's a hot potato for some people. But in terms of what p- role does a cosmetic surgery play um, in the life of women, Christian women in particular? And I'm not sure what I'm asking, except that um, is that off limits to Christian? Well, you I know? think I think it's clear in the throughout the Bible that God. God's original concept of beauty was not what we face today to, mm-hmm. you know, turn gray, get wrinkled, you know, lose our beauty and, and decline in our bodies yeah. until the point that we die. Um, I think it comes down to, and, and maybe this is a decision for everybody as an individual, mm-hmm. if you're looking at it to to take that measure to feel good about yourself in place of mm-hmm. putting your self-worth as a child of God, and mm-hmm. in your relationship to God, which clearly then I think that that's a, a, a negative decision. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, for there's lots of different beauty strategies all the way from, you know, the color of your clothes and, and styles to makeup. And, um, you know, I think there's nothing wrong at all with trying to be the best that you can be, that mm-hmm. God designed you to be and, um, you know, to be an effective um, person out there in the world to... Mm-hmm share God with other people. Well, sure, because if we're, if we are looking like the picture of an unkept person, then (laughs) would you be attracted to that person to say, oh, what's different about them? I sure, I would not want to know what made them like that. If I did, it would be out of curiosity to not do that. Right. But how are we really going to portray an image of Christ or something that people are attracted to. Mm-hmm. And Leviticus 19:18 states that you should love your neighbor as yourself, insinuating that you should have a self-love mm-hmm. and that goes along with self-respect to, you know, keep yourself you know, good hygiene, healthy, um, yeah. good state of mind, all the different things that go into a person's beauty. And as I hear you talk, um, Sherry and Nicole, I think about beauty is a good thing. I mean, uh, you know, I have this article here that says that uh, it's mentioned many times in the Bible in association with women of God, such as um, Sarah, Rebecca. Um, those were said to be very beautiful, but they have something extra in terms of their character. So there is um, a perversion of beauty. I never mm-hmm. read that before. This is from That's a book a called Wanting to, Wanting to Be Heard by Michelle Graham. That's one of the resources we have on our website, hopeonfire.org, for those mm-hmm. listening. And um, it talks about the perversion of beauty in pride, self-absorption, and, and self-worship. So God creates these these great things that are so easy, but we take them and, and pervert it into something else. We prostitute mm-hmm. our beauty yeah. in, in many ways. Oh, that's and a good way to put it. Clearly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I feel like if, like when you're talking about extreme makeover, the perversion mm-hmm. of beauty, if you, let's say, are born with a cleft palate, <clears throat> excuse me, then I'd understand if you're going to get cosmetic surgery. It's not necessary to make you beautiful, but mm-hmm. it's to fix so that you can live a healthier life because that's going to cause problems down the line. Mm-hmm. But if you're born with, smaller chest you don't need that in life i mean that's the way that god intended you to be if he wanted you to look different then you would have been born differently Mm -hmm. and something like that doesn't really make sense and i'd understand how that would be a provision of beauty but Mm -hmm. if you really wanted like let's say you had a mastectomy after Mm -hmm. you had breast cancer Mm -hmm. i'd sympathize with that i'd understand that you you grew up this way and you feel like 
you're half a person because mm-hmm. you're missing that or not a woman because you're missing that. So when it comes to cosmetic surgery, I think that if it's for the wrong reason, then that would be a perversion of beauty because mm-hmm. you're not doing it for yourself necessarily. You're doing it so that other people could be attracted to you or you could fit in with other individuals. And that's not um, personally a good enough reason because down the line you're going to regret it because mm-hmm. it can cause he- like fatal health problems for you. Sure. And, you know, as you were talking, uh, you know, I was reading somewhere an article that the inventor of the Barbie doll later in life developed uh, breast cancer. Oh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, she said it was a wake-up call. It took cancer for her to a wake-up call because she had invented Barbie to help well, so she says, help uh, girls with their self-esteem. Mm. But um, after her breast cancer, she realized <laughs> that ironic. her focus, isn't it a little bit ironic? Her focus perhaps had been wrong, and that it took that to kind of wake her up and not increase the bus size of that doll, yeah. but instead invest her energy. <laughs> and just, are you laughing, Sherry? <laughs> <laughs> I had something heard that before. I have a confession, though. You know, we talked about, I mentioned Extreme Makeover, and uh, I've seen some of those programs where the person is, is considered you know, not attractive and they're transformed. Something in me is, is sort of touched by that because I think in, something in us wants to see transformation. We put it in the physical, but really what we're looking after is a deeper transformation. And um, sometimes when we see the physical, we forget that, that really what guys want to do is something on the inside. Oh, really absolutely. deep, yeah. isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I think when you talk about the concept of beauty, in my opinion, there's three foundations of it. One is your physical health. Mm-hmm. I mean, are you taking care of yourself, eating the right things, getting enough rest, watching your mm-hmm. stress level? Um, another is your attitude. Um, you might refer to it also as your outlook or your mental state. And think about it. You know people... You can tell, like even where you work, if somebody's having a really bad day, you can tell by their body posture. Their body sure. posture is much more contracted. Their the eyesight is down on the floor. Um, breathing is differently. Um, mm-hmm. That definitely impacts how you come across to other people. So physical attitude, and then also your confidence and combined with your self worth. And again, mm-hmm. that's where I come back to: uh, Do you have your sense of self worth based out of your relationship with God and um, as a child of God, or do you have your sense of self-worth um, based on something that you're always going to be chasing after, such mm-hmm. as like what we're talking about here, the concept yeah. of beauty out there in the media yeah. or somebody else's perception of you. Mm-hmm. And I think those three things together um, make up the whole person concept mm-hmm. of beauty because it is not just about the way your face looks or mm-hmm. it's, uh, and think about it too, you Everybody probably knows somebody that they don't think that they're the best looking person in the world, mm-hmm. but man, their personality just grabs you. I'm yes. sure everybody yeah. knows somebody like that. <laughs> and you know, all those factors, uh, in my opinion, make up somebody's beauty. Yeah. And what you're talking about is a wholeness, the strive for wholeness. Mm-hmm. You're challenging right. our listeners not to focus on one, they're more than their bodies, obviously, but you're, you're, you're challenging them to be a whole person. Absolutely. And that's awesome. Absolutely. That's wonderful. And um, in, in our society, or people around us don't always encourage us that way. And I know, uh, Nicole, you were sharing an experience where, you know, you said you were you had not really a problem with, with weight, but you had at one oh, point. Yeah. Remember that? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it mm. was interesting to me. I, like I said before, I've grown up being a, a thin person. Weight was never a struggle for me. I had behavioral things, you know, conform <laughs> to society, but never the weight issue. So... When I got married, I gained a little weight. Usually, I guess that happens for men. Well, Happiness. It happened for me. <laughs> right. <laughs> so as an adult, mm. I was gaining weight and noticing that people treated me differently. They interacted with me differently. They would say things to me that I wasn't ever used to hearing before. Mm. And I remember thinking to myself, uh, "What? I? how do people deal with this? You know, mm-hmm. what mm-hmm. is this really who I am? And understanding that... I'm comfortable with who I am on the mm-hmm. inside and knowing that who I am on the inside isn't reflected by what they're saying about mm-hmm. me on the outside was hard for me to integrate. Yeah. So that was a an eye opener for me. It's such it's so subtle and we have uh, there's a um, I think it's a book we want to recommend to our listeners, Making Peace with Your Thigh. I love that title. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that great? I wish I thought about it before. But uh, in one of those books, it has a sort of, a, of an assessment because it's so subtle that you can actually measure where you are in uh, the spectrum. It kind of asks you different questions and whether whatever depending on what you score, it tells you kind of where you are in that spectrum, like three or fewer statements that you say yes to. Um, it means that you're doing relatively well in a world that bombards us with, with false message messages for our bodies. So I'd recommend our, our listeners to get that book and even try um, uh, this assessment to increase their awareness. And there are other things that they can do to increase their awareness and the kind of move from being self-critical to being more self-accepting. Mm-hmm. Anything that you guys would recommend? 
Well, be comfortable in your own skin, obviously, mm. is an important thing to do. I n- so When you can feel like you're accomplishing something, when you feel like you're contributing in a meaningful way to society, in whatever capacity that is, that really does shift your focus. Mm. You know, I love children. I love interacting with them. I mentor a little girl right now. Mm. That relationship in and of itself makes me feel good about myself for another reason than about why I look the way I look. So you're saying investing in yourself is important. And what about you, Jennifer, in terms of a quick uh, an uh, advice you'd have for your peers, college students out there who might be listening to you? Mm-hmm. Uh, okay. Um, when it comes to yourself, I guess, actually taking the time to realize what's your reasoning behind what you do do. Mm-hmm. Like... Are you waking up in the morning for yourself and God, or are you waking up in the morning to please others? Because if you're doing that, then eventually those people are going to leave. Eventually your beauty is going to fade, but Mm -hmm. I mean, your God and family is always going to be there for you. Mm -hmm. So for me, I think that just being yourself, yeah, Yeah. just being yourself. We're we're wrapping (laughs) up. So much we could say, but I want to say thank you ladies for your input and uh, for being part of our program today. Hope on Fire is produced by Livestreams Media, a listener-supported ministry. To download a free copy of today's program or be a part of our social network, please visit our website at hopeonfire.org. You may also contact us by writing to Livestreams Media, P.O. Box 608-513, Orlando, Florida, 32860. Once again, that's Livestreams Media. P.O. Box 608-513, Orlando, Florida, 32860, or online at hopeonfire.org. Thank you so much for your letters and continued support. Until next time, may God set your hope on fire.